Hello and welcome back to Unheard, I'm Florence Reed. Woke. It might be one of the most overused words of the last decade, but like it or not, the word itself and the politics that it describes seem to be here to stay. So it's probably a good idea to ask, what do we really mean when we call something woke and why does it even matter? With luck, someone much smarter than I has spent many years considering these very questions. Her name is Susan Nyman. Susan is a world-renowned moral philosopher and the author of many best-selling books, most recently the nomically titled Left is Not Woke. I'm holding a proof copy here. Professor Nyman joins me live from the East Coast to talk more about it. Thanks for taking some time to talk to us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's start with, because we're doing some philosophical heavy work here, I hope. Let's start with a bit of a working definition, because otherwise what we're going to do is kind of stray out into the wilderness of wokeness without any real sense of what we're talking about, because woke is a word that doesn't really have a, a working definition per se. So in the context of your book, what do you mean when you call something woke? So what's really interesting is that on every single subject that I've ever written a book about, uh, people always want me to give a definition. And I have to argue that definitions are not actually what we need. We need analyses. And I've had this conversation about evil, over which I wrote a book. I've had this conversation about basically everything that I've ever written about. What we need are analyses, not definitions that allow us, you know, give us a set, a rule which says this is woke, this is not, um, this is evil, this is not. This starts, this starts us on a tricky, a, a tricky beginning because the pro problem is here, of course, is if we can't define what woke is, then how can we say the left is, is or is not woke? Well, you know, <laughs> it's like the famous statement about pornography, right? You recognize it when you see it. We're all talking about it because there is a phenomena that everywhere I go, whether or not I mention the phenomena, the, the title of my book, uh, I have other people starting conversations and I, I travel a fair amount. I have friends in many countries and it's not me that's starting these conversations, it's them. And I decided to write this book after the fourth or fifth conversation in which an old friend who I would have identified as left all their lives said, I guess I'm not left anymore. Look what's happening um, to the left. Certain kind of identity, identitarian politics, a certain confusion of justice with power, uh, a certain despair about the possibility of progress, even as people are say that they're working for progress. And I decided, no, no, <laughs> I'm not giving up the word left. I've been on the left all my life, and so have you. Um, let's examine whether or not the left is really woke or the woke is left. I actually couldn't decide which way to um, uh, have the title work. Both of them would have worked, but my publisher said it was too complicated to try and say left is not woke and woke is not left. What I have done in this book is to provide some criteria of what it means to be left and liberal. And I'll tell you what they are. Uh, this is, these are three principles that both liberals and leftists have in common. We believe in universalism and not tribalism, that the most important thing connecting people are not the accidents they were born with, but the convictions that they have and the principles they stand for. That's number one. This does not mean that everybody has to be all the same or that cultural differences are uninteresting. Of course, cultural differences are interesting. But the fundamental thing that holds us together um, is a sense of human dignity that we recognize in every other human being, no matter where they came from. That's number one. Number two we believe in the possibility of making a distinction between justice and power. Now, it's often a very hard distinction to make in practice, but the idea that justice is not simply one tribe's accumulating more power than the other is deeply important both to liberals and leftists. Finally, the belief that progress is possible through the efforts of people working together. 
this is sometimes caricatured as the belief that progress is inevitable, which I was going to say no person in their right mind be ever believed, but in some pieces of both Hegel and Marx, it looks like they are both saying that progress is inevitable. This is different from the claim that progress is possible, um, which was a revolutionary claim round about the 18th century. Now, all those three principles are common to people who are liberals and leftists. There's one principle that distinguishes leftist from liberals. So that's a fourth principle. And that's just the idea that along with political rights that we have towards freedom of speech and freedom of worship and uh, the right to vote for who we want and travel where we like, all those are liberal principles. We also have social rights. And those are rights to education, to health care, access to culture, um, a whole set of workers' rights that in liberal countries and among liberals are called benefits or safety nets um, or even entitlements. And that's a very different concept than thinking that, the, believing that all of those things are rights. They were codified in the 1948 UN Declaration on Human Rights, which is uh, was ratified by most countries in the world. Um, it's never been entirely put into practice, but to be a leftist as opposed to being a liberal means that you think these aspirations in the UN Declaration of Human Rights are not utopian, it's possible to achieve them. Is it that, and here we're reaching a kind of definition by negation, which maybe is the classic philosophical thing to do, but might also be quite confusing for our audience, but those principles then, if they are not what wokeness is, does that give us a hint to what wokeness is? It does give us a clear idea of what wokeness is. And unfortunately, my thesis is that while there are a lot of leftist emotions among the woke, they're guided by the same emotions, okay? Um, a concern for marginalized and oppressed communities, a desire for justice, uh, the interest in working towards progress, they're caught by theories that undermine those genuinely decent emotions which they share with people on the left and that that's the confusion so that when people talk about the woke left or the far left or the radical left they're actually you know they're noting a set of emotions but the theories that have taken over in public discourse in the last 20 30 years undermine what are genuinely decent and praiseworthy emotions so that we're going in the opposite direction that we intend to go in. Or we, when I say we now, I include also those who get called the woke left, but, but are being undermined by the, the theory. Now, this does not mean by any means, you know, that everybody's a philosopher and that everybody has studied deeply, say, the works of Michel Foucault, the most quoted author in post-colonial studies, or Carl Schmitt, uh, weirdly a Nazi, uh, a totally unrepentant Nazi, who has had a lot of influence on the left. I'm not saying that uh, people who consider themselves to be woke have studied seriously the works, but they pass into the culture. They're, they're uh, in fairly straightforward forms, you can see them in the media, you, you can see a set of assumptions in the media and that are based on some very wrong-headed philosophy. So I thought it was time for a philosopher to come along and try and untangle that. It's a shame as well that it seems that there are so many misreadings underpinning this movement, if that is the case, because it does seem to have cropped up in academic circles. It's uh, amongst university graduates that this kind of ideology seems to have caught grip. And so why is it that those people who should surely be the most highly educated, the most well-read, have fallen prey to such bad misreadings of these kind of classical texts? That's a great question. Um, I don't think they're misreadings of classical texts, though. I think that... Misusings, perhaps. Well, no, no. I think that the sort of foundational 
theorists of woke and post-colonial movements are just dead wrong, okay? So they've started, they've started with a really dodgy bit of theory and then they've opened out from there, okay. <laughs> That's exactly correct, okay? Now, why, what's the appeal of this dodgy bit of theory? I think it's because liberalism has been so disappointing in so many ways. Um, and frankly, I don't think the left has gotten its act together since 1991. I don't think there has ever been uh, enough of a serious public discussion of why state socialism collapsed. I always have to say this, I'm not a Stalinist, I'm not a defender of the Soviet Union, but the collapse of state socialism has been used to uh, suggest, in Margaret Thatcher's uh, famous words, there is no alternative uh, to neoliberalism. And that's basically the view that has swept the majority of the world. And many people who would have traditionally called themselves left really didn't know what to do, um, weren't in a position to do a sort of careful critique of what had gone wrong with state socialism, what might be changed, how it might work uh, differently, and were quite helpless. And then on the other hand, people see the failures of liberalism, the ways in which, although many countries, I guess Britain and the United States, sometimes I'm not sure of either, but many countries profess uh, a commitment, say, to equality of opportunity in a situation where everyone knows the gap between wealth and poverty is increasing enormously, where everyone knows how much influence um, money and corporate sway has on politics. So I think that's one reason why people are attracted to the theories of this Nazi, Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt showed or, or wrote about the hypocrisy of liberal democracies. And he wrote about the hypocrisy of countries uh, claiming to stand up for freedom and democracy and yet holding vast colonies. He talked about Britain's colonial empire. He talked about the United States and the Monroe Doctrine. And of course, he's absolutely right about that. The problem is what people fail to notice is he's writing about that in 1942. You know, That is, this is support for Nazi Germany and basically saying everybody else is just as bad. They're just slightly more hypocritical about. Okay. So we can go ahead and colonize, um, you know, Europe, uh, all the way from, I don't know, Belgium to Vladivostok, because the people we're fighting basically did a softer version of the same thing. Now, um, and and by the way, one of the things that, that always shocks me about Schmidt, about the so-called left's embrace of Schmidt, is this is not somebody who at the end of the war decided, you know, he was wrong. He didn't ever. To the end of his days, he insisted that he had been right. And his favorite place to hang out, aside from his little village in uh, northern Germany, was Franco's Spain. He thought it was a great place. It's more than a small irony that potentially, if you're right, and Schmidt is the kind of earth thinker of a lot of these woke ideas, that the group who online are quickest to call other people Nazis might actually have been themselves infected with Nazi ideology without even realizing? Um, it's something that academics know who've spent some time with it. Um, it's also something that everybody knows about Heidegger, who's also enormously influential uh, on leftist theory, who was also a completely unrepentant Nazi. And, and um, you know, but they are certainly more... Uh, more influential than 
the people I think we should be listening to and reading, which are the philosophers of the Enlightenment. But Schmidt and Nazi, uh, Schmidt and Nazi, um, Schmidt and Heidegger are, um, you know, are, are one side of of the theoretical influences that I think are extraordinarily mistaken. The other is the French thinker Michel Foucault, who is the most quoted thinker of um, post-colonial studies. He's not someone who, um, you know, these are these are these are people who are dead and have been dead for a while. So it tends to be their students and epigonies who get read in college classrooms. But I would wager, I haven't done a study, I would wager that if undergraduates who are not specializing in philosophy read one book of philosophy, it's Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Now, Foucault is a very slippery figure. He certainly was not an unrepentant Nazi. And I even have one friend actually the friend in whose apartment I'm sitting at the moment, who thinks I'm... <laughs> dangerous. This is dangerous territory. You might get he's evicted. Asked, he's, asked, no, he's, no, he's, read, he's, he's read my manuscript. He offered some criticisms, including saying, you know, he thought I was unfair to Foucault. He once had a three-hour conversation with Foucault in which Foucault claimed that all that he was doing was for the sake of liberation. But Foucault is a very slippery figure, what disturbs me so much about Foucault is not necessarily the tribalism. That's not his issue. His issue is that there is no distinction between justice and power. There's a very famous and very interesting television debate between him and Noam Chomsky that ran on Dutch television in 1970. I highly recommend it. It's still floating around on the internet. Back when TV and used after, to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And afterwards, uh, Chomsky said that um, uh, Foucault was the most amoral man he ever met. Um, Foucault took a very radical view of the idea that Moral judgments are not something we should make and not something we can justify. But rather than justifying that claim, he, he's, he's just dismissive. He's very contemptuous of anyone who makes moral judgments um, and talks about just, justice rather than power. One more, one more point where I think uh, Foucault's influence has been disastrous. In many of his books, Discipline and Punish being the most famous and typical one. He talks about how things which looked like they were progress, that looked like reforms that would make the world better, actually turned into what uh, he saw as a more insinuous and a more disturbing form of uh, oppression and repression. And it's that message that has infected the woke to this day because, you know, they're often unwilling to acknowledge any form of progress. 